Welcome to Classical Conditioning, where we'll learn about one of the most fundamental methods for us to learn, and also, as we'll find out, one of the most unconscious, in many cases, ways we learn. This and more to come. Some basic questions we have would be, what is classical conditioning? And as we'll find out, some of the initial ways that we learned about it was not through human research, but through animal research. And of course, animals and humans have many ways in which we learn differently, but as we'll find out, classical conditioning is one of the basic ways of learning. And even though we feel more advanced as humans, we still learn many things through this very basic classical conditioning. So we'll talk about what does it mean to be a behavioral psychologist? What does that mean in terms of your approach to explaining how people think and how people learn? What are we missing if we just stick with a strict behavioral perspective in terms of missing out on some of the other more advanced, more high level ways that humans learn? But let's start with some of the basic things that classical conditioning can be associated with. We'll talk about in more depth what associative learning is and how classical conditioning is one type of it. But think of the things that are typically classically conditioned. It is a behavior, it is a feeling. And if we're talking about something that basic animals can also learn, we have to start with things that we share in common with basic animals. So basic feelings such as feeling sick, feeling afraid, feeling anxiety, feeling sexually aroused. What does this have to do with advertisements? Well, think about what the goal of an advertisement is. In some ways, an advertisement might want to make a high level appeal, buy our product because we're making this case for you to want to uh, be interested in our product. But other ways, a less central route would be sort of unconscious associations. So for example, if you just look at a smiley face and feel relaxed, or we look at this arrow in the FedEx logo and feel that it's efficient and speedy, we might have these associations without being consciously aware of them. And so as a way to get our foot in the door to figure out what classical conditioning is, it's important to think about how we learn in ways that maybe we're not trying to learn. We're, we've made associations and they affect our judgments in ways that we are often not consciously aware of. We'll also talk about the basic paradigm for showing classical conditioning, and it has to do with dogs and tones and drool. And of course, hopefully it will make this basic paradigm relevant to humans as well. Although, you know, we're not, maybe not aware of our saliva response. Uh, for example, when we smell tasty food, we also have it. Uh, so we have this basic similarity with dogs and we can expand this into many other areas in which we probably have been classically conditioned. Uh, and again, many times potentially unaware that this association exists. But first, some true false. When we talk about behaviorist or behavioral psychology, it is very clear that they do not care about how people think, what causes them to be motivated. We don't care about the thought process at all with strict behavioral psychology. All we care about is if we change something about the environment, does people's responses change? And if so, that's all we need to know. This is false, as we'll find out. The, even the simplest animals, as we'll show in a little bit, show evidence of being able to learn through basic classical conditioning. We'll talk about the behaviorist perspective, um, and especially when we introduce B.F. Skinner later on with operant conditioning. And he took this very far to say that humans feel that they have free will, but in many ways, it's an illusion due to behaviorist principles. Pavlov did not go that far. So it's important to distinguish uh, between people, behaviorists, who overgeneralized how important this stuff is, and especially its impact on free will. Pavlov does not seem to be one of them. You might have heard the black box referred to as 
uh, a simile for the mind. And this is actually true. Behavior said, look, people have thoughts and oftentimes they don't know why they have them. And we can't really control people's thoughts and feelings. So let's just view it as this sort of black box that will always be unexplainable. Of course, today, we don't have that same view in large part because we have a lot more advanced neuroimaging techniques and we can see the brain working and understand it better than we could 80 years ago when behaviorism was dominant. This is also true. Basically, when we do high level learning, such as trying to pay attention to a lecture and remember facts and those kinds of things, the pathways in the brain that represent or map that information are different. And so another example of classical conditioning affecting us in ways that are different from our higher order free will pathways shows that uh, our brain structures that map this learning are different than our high level kinds of learning. This is one of those interesting cases so weird that it actually is true. We'll talk about Pavlov uh, doing the doggy drool study. And as he ramped up uh, trying to explore more of what classical conditioning can do, he actually sold the dog saliva that he used um, as a treatment for Russians to treat their upset stomachs. I don't know if he had research to support that this was a useful treatment for this illness. I hope that he did, uh, given that he was a good researcher. But let's step back a bit before we dive into the details and talk about what is our definition of learning. Basically, it is a change in behavior due to experience. Something in the environment happens and that changes our future behavior. And this chapter is centralized around three basic ways that we learn. In this slideshow, we're talking about classical conditioning. In the next, we'll talk about a related form, also a form of associative learning called operant conditioning. So it'll be important to distinguish that they have some similarities, but that also they have some key differences. And then we're moving this last kind of learning a little bit more toward our higher level and not uniquely human, but more uh, human compared to other animals, observational learning. We take it for granted that we can just watch somebody perform an action and then we can remember from that person's experience to change our behavior as a result of simply watching. If you've worked with animals a lot, animals do not, especially um, a lot of the animals that we have for pets, cats and dogs, they don't really show the ability to do much observational learning. Um, and so if we want to understand our cats and dogs and our animals as pets, we need to understand that they can't learn the way that we can learn. And hopefully through some of these techniques, classical and operant conditioning, we'll have more insight into why do our dogs and cats behave strangely and seem to have learned things that we didn't want them to learn and weren't trying to teach them. If you listen to some of this material and think about it, one of your reactions might be that it is not very difficult, uh, that it was sort of obvious that we can learn through these ways. And that's also true. Uh, there's evidence that people before there was a psychology field have clearly showed that we learn through these associative learning techniques. What's different though, is that now we have strong experimental paradigms to clearly show that not only does it work in practice, but now we can break it down and test out little variations of classical and operant conditioning as well. And as you can see, the more general term of associative learning is learning that things go together, a stimulus and a behavior. The key difference though, is that classical conditioning, the stimuli come first and then the behavior. Whereas that is flipped for operant conditioning in which the behavior comes first and then there's a consequence, a reward or a punishment for that behavior. Here we can see on the top an example of classical conditioning, which we'll expand on here. And then an example below 
of operant conditioning, which we'll learn in a different narrated slideshow. So think about a simple sea snail, something that is neutral if it spends most of its life in water. If you splash it with water, it shouldn't have much of a response to it. It's used to getting splashed all the time. However, if you take a sea snail and then shock it, uh, so you have an electrical current applied to some part of its body, would you see a response to that? In fact, yes, it would show uh, muscle constriction, muscle tightening, some movement in response to that electrical shock. So how does this fit into classical conditioning? Well, the order of operations is very important. So first you take the thing that was neutral, that comes first, and then pair it with the shock. Now, for humans, sometimes we only need a few pairings, and then we've learned it, and in many cases, maybe have learned that association forever. With sea snails, unfortunately, you might have to pair these splash, shock, splash, shock, dozens, hundreds of times. But when you get to the point where you want to test whether learning has happened, all you need to do is then only do the splash. And if you start to see muscle constriction, movement, tightening in response to just the splash, you've shown that now the animal has learned due to experience that it anticipates the shock and the splash now signals the shock. Compare that with operant conditioning. Let's say you want to teach uh, a pet a trick uh, or a pet maybe to not go to the bathroom inside, whatever the behavior it is that you want to shape. Unfortunately, oftentimes you have to wait for that behavior to happen first. You can put the seal and the ball in the same area, but the seal might ignore that ball for a long time. So you have to be watching for when does that seal start to play with the ball and then be right there to reinforce or reward that behavior so it gets something it likes, which makes in the future it more likely to go play with this ball because it associates this behavior with this reward. So hopefully you can see the difference between classical and operant conditioning, which if it's a little fuzzy now, it'll get clearer as we continue to work through both of these. Let's talk about the origins of behaviorism. John Watson was one of the first big behaviorists. He was one of a surprising amount of people who saw the field of psychology as being dominated by the Freudian psychodynamic, explore the unconscious view. The problem with that, which emphasized almost completely mental processes, weird stuff that's going on in our brains and in our psyche that we can't directly tell other people about is of course it's kind of squishy science uh, and when you test some of Freudian views and theories to science it becomes very difficult because how can you measure what somebody can't tell you is in inside their psyche so Watson and other behaviorists said I'm gonna ignore all this Freudian stuff let's focus just on the behaviors and we can actually start to get data and do objective science of course we're going to find out later on that there are ways to do objective science with some of the mental processes that Freud and others thought were important. The problem is they don't fit neatly into the behaviorist paradigms that we'll cover directly. And of course we have Pavlov. We've introduced him a few times before, but today here's the formal introduction. He was a Russian physician, uh, physiologist, and in fact, what his research interest was, was digestive secretions in dogs. He wanted to learn more about the digestive tract. And through setting up a standardized or controlled way to study digestive secretions, he started to figure out that dogs started drooling and having strong responses to other things that he was doing. While he was setting up the lab, dogs started reacting to that. He was very interested into why would a dog start to react to things that I'm doing that are important, but that the dog shouldn't care about. And so that's the origin for this research paradigm that just blew up and Pavlov um, expanded drastically, gained a lot of notoriety and respect in Russia. And also this classical conditioning paradigm that we're talking about will be found in any intro psychology book, just to show the impact that Pavlov had not only on his chosen field of biology, but also the field of behaviorist psychology. 
So let's get into some more detail about what classical conditioning looks like. We're associating two stimuli. So first of all, the lightning comes before the thunder. The thunder is what's really loud and scary and causes our muscle tension. But if the lightning is paired and precedes the thunder enough times, we might see a lightning strike and start to tense up anticipating the thunder. So that's one example of classical conditioning. We can also do tone and food, uh, which we'll talk about is what Pavlov did. The key is it starts with a reflex, or maybe a better way to phrase it, is something that naturally happens, right? Loud noises causes a fear reflex. But if something comes before that loud noise and we learn to associate those two together, now that thing that was neutral is not neutral anymore after learning because it causes a response. Uh, and Watson actually had one of the most famous examples of classical conditioning. He took a baby, uh, let's say six months old, uh, pre-language baby, and put uh, a white rat or a white bunny in front of it. And cute white fuzzy things are things that babies naturally are interested in. And that's the same thing for <laughs> who was named Little Albert. And so Watson wanted to take this natural association and see if he could condition a different response. So he took a loud gong or bell and when the rabbit was shown to the baby Albert, then he would basically scare the baby. You can argue this was not an ethical thing to do, especially because as we'll find out, once you've caused a classical association to be learned, absent brain damage will probably carry that association with us to some degree for the rest of our lives. So this is powerful stuff. We don't forget classically conditioned responses as we'll find out. So you wanna be careful, especially with babies, uh, not to cause intense fear responses when you shouldn't. But of course, Watson wasn't thinking of those things 100 years ago. And so what do you know? He caused that baby Albert to then, that rat he used to like, to be afraid of. And then of course, the logic was, what else can I do? Uh, how will this fear response generalize? So would it uh, generalize to a stuffed rat and a stuffed white rabbit? And in fact, it would. So what you've done is caused not only a fear response to that one specific stimulus, but you've caused that fear response to generalize to other similar things. Then Watson thought, well, I should try and see if I can get that response to go away. And as we'll find out, that is, you can in the moment uh, maybe look like that response has been forgotten, but once you have a classically associated uh, association, for lack of better words, it can come back at unpredictable times. So more on that to come. We'll come back to this slide as well once we've introduced what is the UCS and UCR, but here's the basic uh, pairing. So of course, present a dog with food, it starts to drool. Sound a tuning fork or a tone or a doorbell, whatever your neutral stimulus is, uh, and that dog should not have a response to it. Doorbell might be a bad example because it might have learned that the doorbell signals something else important, such as a visitor. So let's stick with a tuning fork. Now, here's the conditioning or learning phase, and it's important that the neutral stimulus has to come first. Tone, then food, tone, then food. And now, after conditioning, you can just sound the tone, and the dog will have a saliva response to that now conditioned or learned stimulus. And as you can see, Pavlov expanded to have giant labs full of dogs with cheek tubes attached to their salivary glands. And so it seems a little gross for us, but what you can see is that it gives you a very nice quantitative or measurable response uh, of saliva. And that's valuable for behaviorists. Now you have a numerical variable to actually show that this is important in terms of changing behavior. And if you look at Freudian stuff, psychodynamic stuff, it's tough to get nice quantitative measures like that, or at least it was 100 years ago. And so that now you can see why behaviorism seemed to have such an important draw for the scientific community, for psychologists who wanted to get more respect 
from the hard sciences, because now we're doing measurable science. So let's introduce formally some of these terms. The unconditioned stimulus is the food. This is what naturally, instinctively causes a response. And of course, that unlearned response with food is saliva. Why do I have this yellow banana here? Well, because there's theory out there and some research to support it that uh, bright colors like fruit uh, tend to trigger unconditioned or they, re they represent unconditioned stimuli because they contribute, uh, trigger the unconditioned response of hunger. So as you've noticed, whenever you walk into a grocery store, you have to first walk through the fruit and vegetable aisle with the idea that we are naturally, as humans, um, going to have our hunger response triggered by seeing fruits and vegetables. Even if we don't buy it, uh, specifically, we are going to buy more of the other products because those trigger our unconditioned response of hunger. And of course, you know, you don't want to go to the grocery store when you're hungry, but you might have a hunger response, even if you don't think you're hungry, uh, triggered a little bit by what uh, is stimulated when you walk in the door to the grocery store. Now, after learning has taken place, the neutral stimulus that used to be neutral now is a conditioned stimulus. The tuning fork before learning did not trigger salivation, but after learning does trigger salivation. And of course, our response is the same, salivation, but it's conditioned now because it's triggered by something else. So not only after learning is salivation triggered by the food, that unconditioned association is still there. After learning, that conditioned response is now um, called a conditioned response because it is generated by something that was previously neutral, the tuning fork. So lots of words, lots of explanation, but if you can understand this basic Pavlov paradigm, you'll be in good shape. So think about the learning curve. You have the neutral stimulus, then the food, which triggers then the unconditioned response of hunger, right? Neutral stimulus, then food. And then as we've shown, and as you probably knew even before uh, watching the slideshow, that you've triggered or taught this association. So Pavlov, once he learned that and clearly showed it, now he wanted to play around with it. What happens now if I stop pairing the unconditioned and the neutral stimulus or conditioned stimulus after learning? So then just ring the bell and remove the unconditioned stimulus. What happens? Well, as you can imagine, once we've learned a basic association, we expect it to stay there. And of course, if that deal changes, we notice it as this angry dog shows evidence for. So with the general theme of once learning has happened, now let's play around with how often we're presenting the food or the unconditioned stimulus, what happens? So first of all, as we'll show in a, a slide coming up, the learning, the learning curve where we put all of these terms together, if you just keep sounding the tone, but never uh, pair food with it again, keep sounding the tone, no food, sounding the tone, no food, you'll get what looks like is called extinction, meaning there's no salivation anymore. However, after time passes, sound that tone again, and you might see spontaneous recovery. So what that means is once it shows evidence that once that associative pairing has been learned, it will tend to stay there in memory. And when it comes back, and how strongly it comes back, seems to be somewhat random or spontaneous. We can't predict it. All we know is that that learned association is not gone. We also had the idea of generalization. So again, if you learned Pavlov's dogs through a tuning fork, what happens now if you sound a bell? Will that response generalize? will you see salivation to that similar response? And of course, 
think about PTSD, some triggers for anxiety and fear. Of course, hearing gunshots and explosions in combat would be unconditioned stimuli. They naturally cause fear. Now, things such as fireworks or cars backfiring or something falling on your roof, would that association generalize to this similar stimulus? And in many cases, yes. Um, people with PTSD uh, will be triggered and this fear response generalized to similar stimuli that aren't actually dangerous. My example would be, think about what cues hunger. Sometimes just seeing a sign uh, for a restaurant can cue that hunger response. I'm a big rallies fan. I drive by rallies. I get hungry. Burger King, however, doesn't do anything for me. Um, I don't have much of a hunger response to Burger King, so I do not generalize from this fast food stimulus that does make me hungry to this fast food stimulus that does not make me hungry. Which means I don't generalize, but I do discriminate between them. So they're both fast food signs, um, so similar in terms of what product they offer, but I am discriminating between these two similar stimuli. And of course, as we talked about before, extinction is a bit of a confusing word because the association is never forgotten completely. But during the learning curve, if you stop pairing food with the tone, you can get to a point where it looks like it's extinct in that moment. It looks like there is no more response. And as we'll find out, these basic terms can also apply to operant conditioning. So for example, you can train a dog to sit through dog treats um, and you can change what kind of treats you're using and you can still get that behavior response that you're trying to elicit. So let's put all these terms together into one image. Here is the start of learning, sound, the tone, and you get no response at all, no salivation. Of course, now you're pairing uh, the neutral stimulus first, tone, with the unconditioned stimulus, food, tone food, tone food, tone food, and then you see the height of the learning association. So sound that tone, get a ton of saliva. Now you remove the food, tone, 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 no food. Eventually you'll get to the extinct phase where now you're sounding the tone and getting no salivation. Of course, then the question is, in this moment, it looks like it's extinct or forgotten. Will it stay that way? And how long will it stay that way? Well, wait a month, uh, weeks, uh, it's unpredictable. But at some point, sound that tone again. And what do you know? What previously looked to be extinct, now you see a salivation response. And of course, that salivation is not as much as it was at the height of learning, but it is also still substantial. It is definitely not zero. Which, if we think about examples to PTSD, right, that person probably will always have some sort of fear response to just loud noises. Um, but what you can do is reduce the extent of that response. So of course, then go back to baby Albert. We've conditioned poor baby Albert to be afraid of white fuzzy things. Now, when he was in training, with the gong, of course, that fear response was super high. What you can do then is sort of counter condition or try to get that fear response to zero. And of course, that poor baby Albert might have a flashback at unpredictable moments, see something white and fuzzy, and then all of a sudden get fearful for what feels like a random um, weird reason. Uh, but of course, that fear response, though, it will never probably go away will not be as intense as it, it was during the learning curve. These are also many of the things that Pavlov played with. He really tried to explore the many different ways that you can play around. So of course, here now we're talking about stimulating, not necessarily shocking, um, but stimulating a certain part of the body and then measuring the saliva response um, and then if you've learned on a certain part of the body, um, will that stimulation of different parts of the body 
uh, generalize. And you see, they sort of generalize, although the amount of saliva from the front paw is substantially less than the amount of saliva from the hind paw. So of course, kind of boring from our purposes, but just to give you an idea of just how determined and how many different variations of this basic paradigm that Pavlov designed. Romantic attraction, sexual attraction, um, can also be very much through classical conditioning. Related to that, think about uh, attraction in humans. Part of what causes attraction is not classical conditioning. We like people because we like their intelligence, we like uh, their kindness, but also we might be attracted to them through some of the things that cue our natural sexual arousal. So of course, something like making out is going to naturally cause sexual arousal. You didn't have to learn that. Uh, that's just part of being human. But what precedes making out? Uh, sometimes being in a certain place on a certain couch or a certain smell can trigger that sexual arousal response because it signals or comes before making out. And it doesn't happen ha have to happen or be paired very often, a few times, and you can then have a sexual arousal response just to the perfume. And if you think about it, this can really explain the idea of fetishes. Why do people become sexually aroused to things that really shouldn't naturally cause sexual arousal? Well, because they're paired a few times with something that does, and then that person then is classically conditioned for the rest of their lives to some degree. Also think about another common response to sexual arousal. Um, seems very unrelated, but things like sickness also have a strong classical conditioning component. So of course, treating cancer, uh, you would have maybe chemo, chemotherapy drug, which causes nausea, sickness. What comes before the administration of the drug? Being in the waiting room, perhaps. So waiting room before the drug, and then the drug causes the nausea. But in the future, then that nausea is triggered even before we get the drug, just through the waiting room. And what this illustrates to us is that in many ways, classical conditioning is irrational. Classical conditioning is some ways happening unconsciously. We don't want to feel sick in response to just being in that waiting room. And in fact, we shouldn't, right? Because what we should feel sick from is that drug, right? But that's not what our body and our, uh, our sort of subcortical, our non-higher order learning system is actually learning. Also think about in terms of, we'll talk about food aversions. I have a food that I no longer eat. It's not the food itself that caused you to get sick that time. It's that maybe too much of it, if it was uh, maybe over drinking, uh, having too much alcohol. And that's not what we learn, unfortunately. We should learn, don't drink too much alcohol. But instead, what we've learned is I don't drink tequila anymore because one time that made me sick. Or I don't eat sushi anymore because one time I had sushi that had bacteria in it. And it's the bacteria that causes us to get sick. But what we learn, what we associate, and we weren't trying to learn this, is that now I just don't eat sushi anymore because that triggers my sickness response. If you have pets, especially dogs in my example, um, they have responses many times to things that I don't understand. Why are you looking at me? What do you think is going to happen now? What did I do or what did you hear that has now cued your hunger response? Uh, I have a great example too. We have a dog uh, that every time I make pizza, the dog cowers in fear and tries to get into its kennel. And we wondered, what is it about me making pizza, putting together pizza dough, that is scary for this dog. Well, the dog has learned that oftentimes when I make pizza, the smoke alarm might go off. And it's been paired enough so that I don't even have to turn the oven on. I'm just making the dough. And the dog associates that behavior as signaling the likelihood that the smoke alarm will be going off in the near future.
Also, I wanted to put Pavlov in context and to show that, yes, he did a lot of work with dogs and drool, but he was also celebrated as a voice of reason uh, in the scientific community. And he was viewed very well by people uh, in the Russian government and the Russian populace in general. And we'll find out uh, also that Pavlov resisted in terms of uh, societal changes, the Russian Revolution, uh, the Bolshevik Re Revolution. And I think we can look at this in terms of modern times as well. We've got a lot of anti-science sentiment out there, and we need people who will stick up for science. Science is, is important, and we need to respect it. And we also need to realize how imperfect it is. And even though it doesn't give us the answers that we really want many times, it's the best we've got. But a quick review, something that should be neutral, a geometric figure, could cause sexual arousal through classical conditioning if it is paired before an unconditioned stimulus. So for example, the figure comes first and then the person makes out or sees pornography, something that would naturally cause arousal, and then you can classically condition this association. As I mentioned before, a taste aversion, sometimes you only need to have that pairing one time and you've learned an association that you'll carry with you the rest of your life. So of course, in this case, the conditioned response would be sickness. And what we should learn is not to overdo it in terms of alcohol or drugs or to eat food that could be tainted with bacteria, but instead, what we learn is we overgeneralize and we won't eat any kind of that food or that beverage in the future because it does cause a sickness response. As we talked about, extinction might not be the best term because, and this is a little picky, because we see spontaneous recovery of the conditioned response. Uh, if this was CR, A would also be correct as well. So for example, if you know the difference between your front doorbell and your back doorbell, and you associate maybe a package being delivered and experience anticipation as a response when the front door rings but not the back door, this would be an example of two similar stimuli but one triggers the association and the other doesn't. We are discriminating between similar stimuli. Quick true-false as we wrap up. Here's another area where we need to be picky between is it classical conditioning or is it operant conditioning? As we've shown, food can have a part in classical conditioning. The important thing is that the behavior doesn't cause the food. That's operant conditioning. You behave and then you get rewarded with food. In this case, the dogs don't have control of when the food or if the food is presented to them. So if it is food first, then it is a classical conditioning stimulus. If it is food as a consequence, as a result of a behavior that came first, then it is operant conditioning. Watson was clearly not a fan of the psychodynamic perspective. He wanted to get as far away from it as he possibly could. As you might guess, um, most of the time, we are not aware of our classically conditioned associations. All we are is aware of when that response kicks in, when we feel a sickness, when we feel the fear. So for example, you might say, I have a fear of hospitals. They just make me queasy. Well, that is not a natural thing. That's not an instinctual thing. You've learned it. You've gone into a hospital and felt sick for some reason, and now you associate the hospital with sickness and again, you weren't trying to learn it, and you don't remember, perhaps, when you learned it. A key point is that our discrimination in classical conditioning, discriminating between two stimuli, the response does not generalize, is different um, from social justice discrimination. So, for example, 
Sushi is not a protected class. It doesn't have legal standing. We can choose to not eat it for whatever reason we want. Also keep in mind, classical conditioning is a very basic form of learning, which means we're dealing with very basic things that almost all living things will experience. Feeling sick, feeling afraid, feeling sexually aroused, which means if we want to train higher order things, such as clapping or dancing or talking, we're gonna to have to use something else, which is probably gonna be operant conditioning or observational learning. As I mentioned before, Pavlov is a respectable figure. He wasn't just a guy that did good science. Um, he had a true social value, uh, and I think we can also respect that as well. For our key study, as we wrap things up, let's look at how we can use classical conditioning in, a plot, in an applied or practical setting. So for example, I blink classical conditioning, think about how this would fit into Pavlov's design. Well, if somebody takes a straw and blows a puff of air into your eye, that's an unconditioned stimulus which causes the unconditioned response of, you guessed it, blinking. Now, if we want to train or teach that association, you just sound a tone before the puff, and then after a couple pairings, you hear the tone, and then you instinctively start to blink. And I shouldn't say instinctively because it's not an instinct. You've learned that the tone signals the puff of air, and so when you hear the tone, you blink. Then researchers have used this paradigm in a number of ways. One would be amnesia. So these are people who maybe can't remember hardly anything of what they did the day before. People they've met, food they ate. Is there a difference between how long it takes them to learn this air puff stimulate uh, association compared to those who don't have amnesia? And what we find is that amnesic patients exhibited normal responses and it didn't take them any longer to learn this learned association. So that also shows evidence that their higher order pathway, remembering what they did yesterday, that's been impaired, but their classical conditioning learning pathway seems to be okay, seems to be working just like a normal person. Now there's also another important application for this basic eye blink association. Alzheimer's. Many times when somebody takes some sort of standardized test to show that their memory is impaired, it's often five, 10 years after they've had Alzheimer's that these tests start to show clear uh, declarative memory differences. What's interesting with Alzheimer's though is you can use this simple and cheap eye blink classical conditioning paradigm and people with Alzheimer's will start to show slower acquisition. It'll take them longer to show this associative learning pairing compared to people who don't have Alzheimer's. And this will start to show earlier than maybe more standardized and more expensive uh, declarative memory tests. So this goes to show that there are some very important uses for one potentially early diagnosis of Alzheimer's that you can apply this basic and simple classical conditioning paradigm. And here you can see uh, this eye blink paradigm. You make sure that somebody's lined up so that the air goes into their eyes, and then you have the tone that comes before the puff. And this is a paradigm that's been used in lots of different types of research applications. Now that we've wrapped things up, let's discuss. What have you learned about classical conditioning? How can you see it working in your life or the lives of people you know, your friends, your family? And bigger picture as we zoom out from a context perspective, how did something that originated from such simple and basic means become applicable to humans? What can we learn from this? Maybe are there other examples of science that was intended for a different population, but that becomes very relevant to us? And of course, once we understand classical conditioning and how it can be uh, problematic in terms of causing us to be afraid of things that we shouldn't be afraid of, causing us to be sick to things that we shouldn't be 
naturally having a sick response to. How can we control classical conditioning, especially for our children and our loved ones, so that maybe it doesn't affect us negatively as much as it otherwise might? Looking forward to discuss this and much more on the discussion boards.